and um, <clears throat> the presentation is um, basically a study of how to secure uh, storage um, and storage networks in uh, Kubernetes systems when you're providing storage with the Rook, which is the CNCF project uh, that provides storage to Kubernetes and Ceph is the most popular provider, or we believe it's the most popular provider in uh, in there. It certainly is with Rook, uh, where there are a few alternatives, but obviously there are other storage options outside of Rook. Uh, this is something that um, I presented with Anna and Michael at uh, the CNCF uh, new security conference last fall. Uh, it's something that um, We'll present again at scale uh, in a new expanded version. Here, the slides still have the template from the CNCF conference, but I've added um, I've added a bit of extra content that's meant for scale. We haven't uh, reskinned the slide yet, and um, we're hoping to present this at a few other places this year. The, the CEP um, main conference in uh, in Portland and the uh probably uh kubecon in um in spain if we get accepted and that's uh, that's the tour that we're planning for these slides it's a pretty advanced ceph talk um i know that uh, neha gave you the the introduction to um uh, uh, to ceph recently so those of you that have watched that are fully prepared um those that haven't, please feel free to stop and um, stop me and ask questions. There is uh, there is plenty of time. This is um, this is a deep talk, but it's um, it's not a super long thing where we don't have time to stop and discuss. So uh, this is the intro slide that I usually use for um, for professional talks. Uh, I think everybody here knows me already. So the short version of this is uh, I work at Red Hat on the Ceph project or the Ceph product to be proper. And um, previously I worked at Canonical as the Ubuntu Server PM, Landscape PM. Before that I was at SUSE where I worked on a bunch of things um, um, primarily involving uh, systems management. So I was known as the systems management star whether it was building images with a certain version of SUSE Studio or uh, the update system for SLES or the package caches uh, that we made for, uh, for the system itself. And uh, you can see from the picture with the clouds around me that uh, I'm one of the authors of the O'Reilly book on AWS operations. And so um, um, for that reason, I was portrayed as the cloud man by the OSCON um portrait official portrait maker um julian cash it looks like you're a lightning rod <laughs> yes it looks like i'm uh, there being uh but being a lightning rod is appropriate for product managers so it goes with the job true true so um what does rook do so um um <clears throat> Before the CNCF started, we used to complain that OpenStack was complicated with too many projects and too many vendors. And now we have exactly the same thing under the CNCF with Kubernetes. So um, uh, the more things change. So the, the thing here is um, uh, what OpenStack did in terms of orchestrating um, virtual machines, Kubernetes does in terms of orchestrating containers. and while Kubernetes has exploded since its 2016 introduction, both commercially and in terms of complexity, I think one could argue that Kubernetes is a little bit less um, um, haphazard than OpenStack was at, at its height because, um, because um, uh, Google provided technical stewardship and direction and basically made choices which in OpenStack, nobody made. In OpenStack, everything had to be possible. So it was initially slightly better. But now we're in the situation where Kubernetes has to fundamentally cover the entire market for data center. 
uh, which makes it a pretty sophisticated platform and that brings complexity. It needs to work at the edge, it needs to work in the data center. Usually what I tell my team is that um, if you're running a data center, bare metal shouldn't be your target. A software defined data center should be your target at this point. And realistically, if you're going to run a software defined data center today, uh, Kubernetes should be your choice. At least that's what um, I and uh, Red Hat and IBM would argue. Uh, there is a potential alternative, which is the edge offering of the cloud vendors, uh, various things like um, snowballs or whatever Amazon calls them. Um, Oracle has been pretty aggressive in this space as a way to compete with uh, Oracle Cloud. It's been pretty aggressive in this space as a way to compete with AWS. Uh, so has been Azure. So um, if you're going to run your own data center and integrate it yourself, it's probably Kubernetes rather than bare metal. If you're going to delegate most of your operations to, to a cloud vendor and then keep some things in house with, uh, with an edge node or a, a private cloud of sort, private uh, region or private zone, depending on what terminology you want to use, um, probably the best, uh, the most obvious, the best depends on who you are. The most obvious solution is, um, is these uh, solutions from the other vendors. And then of course there is VMware and VMware is trying to add containers to, um, uh, to their platform. So don't count them out yet. So lots of options. Um, I didn't mention HashiCorp, of which I'm a fan, because it's uh, it's probably not one of the top three. But um, HashiCorp has an interesting take on simplified uh, data center operations. So it may be a solution for some. And um, typically, if you run your own data center, you're not scared of building your own castle. So um, go forth and explore, I guess. And um, we hope that we obviously hope that Kubernetes is the choice because uh, we are the leading vendor there, but uh, we'll see. Now, uh, Rook is a project that was designed as um, a project under the CNCF to bring storage to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is a container platform, so it's stateless na natively. You spin up the container, does the job it needs. It stores the data somewhere in the cloud, probably in an S3 storage target, we would like that to be Ceph. Um, and uh, then the container spins down, is destroyed, and it's completely forgotten. That's the ideal way to operate in Kubernetes. This is very different from OpenStack, where even a temporary virtual machine needs to have storage, right? So you needed to bring in storage, even if you were going to throw away uh, the VM. So, uh, while Kubernetes was born stateless, the reality is that lots of, um, lots of useful workloads require state. And you can design new workloads so that indeed they do work, they throw it to an S3 target and they disappear, but those are greenfield workloads, they are new. And if there is one thing that you know in the enterprises that 80% of everything out there is old. Um, so um, as people are moving old workloads to new platforms, if the new platform is Kubernetes, they need a local storage to be persisted. And that's what Rook does. Uh, Rook can do persistent storage with a couple of, um, of storage options, but uh, effectively Ceph is what it's built for. And uh, it not only interfaces Ceph with uh, Kubernetes, it also manages Ceph. So it provides an additional layer of meta management on top of Ceph that makes it easier uh, to run a Ceph cluster. So Rook helps reduce the operational burden a storage team faces um, by creating horizontally scaled and self-healing clusters um, in Ceph is complemented by uh, Rook making them increasingly self-managing. So Ceph tries to be self-managing, but it only goes so far. Rook sits outside of Ceph and pushes that further. For example, Rook can carry out an upgrade of Ceph between versions uh, pretty much automatically with one command. So it makes uh, migrating between Ceph versions 
in a software defined environment um, very very easy and um, and that is one advantage of operating in something like Kubernetes rather than straight on bare metal. Uh, so you can have um, we can approach self-managing for Ceph more, and uh, we can also approach uh, self-scaling at some point, um, responding by allocating new nodes um, if the demands for the storage system increases. It's important to understand that in Kubernetes, the storage is laid on top of the compute. That was not the case on OpenStack. So in Kubernetes, you have the compute plane, and then with Rook, you are running Ceph on top of the compute plane. Ceph uses local storage in those compute nodes. Um, the drivers, the CSI drivers that uh, are the interface between the storage system and Kubernetes are also an overlay on top of Kubernetes. So it's, um, it's counterintuitive when, when you come from a traditional background, but it makes upgrading the drivers very transparent because you're basically scrapping a layer on top of the compute and replacing it. Makes replacing the storage similar. You can um, swap out one set of uh, of storage demons for another. Uh, operationally, it's a, it's a charm. Um, so Rook, basically, what I'm getting at is that Rook enables Ceph to deploy on Kubernetes with ease. Uh, brings the benefit uh, of containerization uh, to the storage system. And storage is running atop the compute, um, the compute infrastructure, like just like any other workload. Uh, we also have an option where we can run on bare metal externally to Kubernetes, and that's something that we use for uh, for massive scale. So if you have uh, tens of petabytes of storage, uh, typically you don't want to have the overhead of additional infrastructure there, so you just have the storage node. Uh, running on bare metal, and then uh, being consumed by Rook that's running on top of Kubernetes. This is sort of a hybrid architecture. Uh, we kind of think that over time it's going to go away and that people will accept Kubernetes as a software-defined data center for everything, including storage, which is sort of a, a far-off case. Uh, but today, if you're running a, a 10 petabyte um, storage cluster, you're running it externally to Kubernetes and and then feeding the storage back in using Rook in uh, what we call external mode. Okay, so that's um, the, um, the short introduction to what this is. So now, um, how do we secure Ceph in this environment? And uh, how do we secure Rook in this environment? So um, security practices tend to harden a specific point of the infrastructure. And uh, cherry picking practices without the model of the threat and what the, who the attacker is, is not a viable strategy. So the joke usually goes, if you want to protect from all possible threats, you need to turn the computer off, bury it in concrete, drop it at the bottom of the ocean. In other words, it's completely unusable. And even then, if your data is valuable enough, your adversary will find a way to dredge the ocean and, and bring up that computer and steal your, steal your data. Um, so security needs to be defined in the context of a threat model. Are you facing scripted kiddies or the GRU or the dreaded privileged insider? These are very different scenarios. Some of these want to steal your data. Others want to crypto lock you and hold you for ransom. Others yet may be satisfied by causing disruption, deleting data, or making it public, or by um, performing a transient denial of service. So the, the threat model is critical to defining what you are going to harden. Once you uh, have designed the threat model, then you start cherry picking practices uh, from the ones that we're going to discuss here and see which ones are helpful in mother, uh, moderating that threat. So let's dive right in. The, looking at the network uh, and how it's split here. The public security zone in Ceph is an entirely untrusted area of the cloud. It could be the internet as a whole or just networks external to your cluster that you have no authority over. 
Data transmissions crossing this zone should make use of encryption. Uh, note here that the public zone, as I just defined it, does not include the storage cluster front end, what Ceph calls the public underscore network. So apologies for the terminology horror here, but uh, the public zone is not the public network. Um, the public network defines the storage front end and properly belongs in the storage access zone. Now, the Ceph client zone refers to networks accessing Ceph clients, like the object gateway, the Ceph file system, or block storage. Ceph clients are not always excluded from the public security zone. For instance, it is possible to expose the object gateways S3 and Swift API in the public security zone. The storage access zone instead is an internal network providing Ceph clients with access to the storage cluster itself. So here I'll stop one second. And for those of you that were not at Neha's talk, just a quick uh, reminder of how Ceph works. Ceph is distributed storage. So Ceph is storage and an enterprise storage system that uses standard and compute nodes, um, Dell, Supermicro, you name it, um, to build a, an enterprise storage system. The storage is distributed. Uh, so you can have a dozen nodes or a thousand nodes, and um, it is exposed as a provider of block storage, file storage, or object storage. Um, typically, a Red Hat customers use Ceph as a block storage interface for OpenStack. Um, although we also provide object storage as a replacement of the Swift system in OpenStack. In Kubernetes, we provide block storage for what are called uh, PVs, so persistent volumes in Kubernetes uh, backed by, uh, by block storage, or uh, PVs that are backed by CephFS um, in case they are shared between multiple containers, so they, they need to have a file system um, to arbitrate access. Uh, the third area where Ceph is very popular is building very large on-premise S3 object storage clusters the places where I would say that the containerized application should be throwing data if it wants to remain stateless. Um, so from our point of view, if you build a stateless application uh, like the fathers of Kubernetes wanted, and then you push the data to, to Ceph uh, over S3, we're perfectly happy with that. If you want to use a local storage in the container and persist it to Ceph that way, we're also able to support that. So we're, we're neutral between greenfield, brownfield, and uh, whichever field uh, style of application you want to use. When uh, Red Hat adds virtualization to Kubernetes, uh, to, uh, to OpenShift, not to Kubernetes, uh, we will also support storage for that. So um, we're sort of in a nice place. So these distributed systems, without repeating the entire talk that Neha gave, that we have a recording of, so I will invite you to go over there, um, there are individual daemons on each node that provide storage. These are called OSDs. The, the Paxos, the Quorum algorithm is run by daemons called MONS, monitors, which also run distributed. You usually have three or five in a cluster. And then there are dedicated daemons that provide specific protocols. S3 compatibility is provided by a daemon called RGW, which is one of our most popular. Uh, and that's the uh, RADOS object gateway. And it, on one side, it talks Ceph. On the other side, it talks S3. The placement of these are basically what we're discussing here. We tend to have multiple networks, one that faces the, the storage clients, um, internal networks that's used by the Ceph components to talk to each other, and that um, is often uh, secured by just segregating who can access it. And so it's, it's sort of considered a, a safe network. It would be like being able to open the door to your NetApp appliance and tapping into the back plane directly. It's, it's the kind of network threat that you have to protect against if you have a privileged insider attack model. Uh, but most, most people don't have the privileged insider threat. Uh, so the, they, don't, they don't go to that extreme level. And so uh, the, this is where the, these different networks fall in. So um, the Ceph clients can be anywhere. And that's why um, 
uh, that is is uh, usually um, the area where you look at securing the most. While the um, private network that such components use to talk to each other is something that you can separate either physically because you need to dedicate enough bandwidth that you are going to create dedicated network anyway, or virtually by using a VLAN. So um, that kind of layer separation is usually considered sufficient and not requiring encryption or, or additional uh, privilege separation. So hopefully that makes sense. So, um, so in that context, the client zone refers to networks accessing Ceph clients like the object gateway, the Ceph file system, or block storage. The clients are not always excluded from the public security zone. For instance, it's possible to expose the object gateways as three and Swift APIs in the public security zone. Uh, the storage access zone instead is an internal network providing Ceph clients with access to the storage cluster itself. And finally, the cluster zone refers to the most internal network, providing storage nodes with connectivity for replication, heartbeat, and backfill and recovery tasks. These are basically the internal uh, storage nodes talking to each other uh, and only to each other. Uh, this zone includes the Ceph clusters backend network called the cluster network in Ceph, cluster underscore network. Um, operators often run clear text traffic in the cluster zone, relying on the physical separation or VLAN separation of the network from all other traffic. This would not be a valid choice. Um, I, I already said this, so no need to repeat, but this would not be a valid choice if you are concerned with privileged insiders. Uh, but uh, these four zones are separately mapped on com or combined depending on the use case and the threat model you use. And here is an example um, of uh, security zone access, uh, storage access zone and um, cluster zone and who gets to speak on what. Now we don't need to go into Ceph masterclass level, but um, what we need to see from this picture is that if you're an adver adversary, the natural thing to do here is to attack nodes that sit on the boundaries between, um, between zones. So if you somehow got to the client security zone, uh, which generally means you are on the corporate network, or at least you're in the data center network where somebody can access the enterprise storage, which is a pretty large target. If you're in the uh, client security zone, the next place you would want to breach uh, is the storage access um, security zone. And so you would probably target a node that sits at the edge of these, that has access to both. Uh, you would target RGW, you would target uh, an OSD, you would target something that has uh, the ability to to talk on both networks so that you can breach the next network. Um, so the result is that components spanning the boundary of two security zones with different trust or authentication requirements must be carefully configured. These are the natural uh, target points in network architecture. <coughs> the natural weak points, you could say, if anything goes wrong and should always be configured to meet the requirements of the higher trust level of the zones connected. So <clears throat> if <clears throat> the OSB is uh, sitting on both the, <coughs> excuse me, on the storage access and the Ceph cluster security zones, we need to configure it to the highest level. So the, the cluster security zone so that it does not um, it does not uh, provide additional weakness um, uh, through the port that sits on the um, on the lower security zone. In many cases, the security controls should be a primary concern due to the likelihood of an attack. There are a few things that can be done here uh, in terms of hardening the binaries and the like, and we'll we'll go into that. Um, Operators should generally consider exceeding zone requirements at integration points, which is for a storage product is often easier to accomplish.
For example, the cluster security zone can be isolated from other zones easily because there is no reason for it to connect to other zones. Um, conversely, an object gateway in the client security zone will need to access the cluster security zone's monitors on 6789, OSBs on 6800 to 7300, and would likely expose its S3 API to the public security zone on port 80 and 443. So it's talking to everybody, it's a natural place to, to go look for weakness. Okay, and that's, uh, that's enough on networking. Let's go to encryption. So, um, server-side operators overwhelmingly choose to encrypt data at rest uh, with Ceph using the Linux unified key setup mechanism, which we all know, uh, know as Lux. Um, I haven't surveyed my user base in a while, but, um, we crossed more than 50% of uh, at rest data encryption with Ceph. I think it was in 2016. It's overwhelmingly popular. Um, I would consider it an exception for people not to be encrypting data at rest uh, these days. All data and metadata of a Ceph storage cluster can be secured using a variety of DMCrypt configurations. And I would venture that almost all of Red Hat's customers do. A security best practice is to locate monitor daemons, MONs, uh, on separate hosts from storage daemons, OSDs. And uh, this is to um, ensure anti affinity for um, the keys, the encryption keys, and the data they encrypt. You see, um, Ceph stores encryption keys in, uh, the, uh, in the storage of the monitor daemon. So uh, if somebody walked in your data center and grabbed the computer with its, um, I don't know, 48 disk drives and walked off the door, sort of a physical um, threat model, uh, by using this configuration, uh, they would have the data, but they wouldn't have the encryption keys because you have decided that the MON and, um, and the OSDs are living on different hosts. Additionally, you should encrypt the keys on the monitor as well by using a, an encrypted file system on the host that runs the mon. Uh, but um, the anti-affinity would be the, the first part. The, um, uh, uh, so encrypting the, <coughs> the storage for the mon would be, would be additional. Uh, this results, um, uh, we already covered the threat model here, so no need to go into that again. Um, the object storage gateway has additional capabilities, including uh, encryption at ingestion time. So this is the RGW uh, gateway that I mentioned before that provides the S3 interface. Um, instead of encrypting data at rest, uh, on the file system, which is something that we can do for all ways of storing data in Ceph. Um, the object gateway has the ability to uh, receive S3 objects and encrypt them on the fly. And the reason why this is interesting is that um, there are a few things that are different here. Uh, when RGW does this, it does, um, um, it can take the keys from the end user. So instead of operator managed keys, which is what you get with Lux, uh, you have user managed keys. Um, so you can delegate to the users their own encryption, which may be desirable or may be undesirable, but it is an option. Um, so per user keys instead of per drive keys. Uh, the other thing that's interesting of RGW in this context is that um, RGW can manage the rotation of the keys for uh, for the disk keys or for the user keys um, using tools like HashiCorp Vault. Um, by, uh, RGW supports a standard um, that Amazon basically has defined, uh, AWS SSC KMS, and, um, and that gives us a little bit additional capabilities here, but um, Generally speaking, the key rotation, 
can be managed by Vault. Uh, that's probably the most popular thing. Can be managed by OpenStack Barbican, which is obviously popular um, in OpenStack environments. Uh, it's also useful for scenarios where you want to have a, a physical key management, uh, a physical key unit like a Jamalto or um, I forget who the other vendor is, as those are supported by Barbican. And then um, there is a standard which is called KMIP. And this is um, uh, this is something that a number of products support, like the IBM Key Manager. Uh, it used to be called Spectrum. Now it has a new name. I think it's called Guardium. Um, uh, the IBM Key Manager can also uh, do the same using this protocol. Uh, the ciphers that are used in all of these encryptions um, are certified under FIPS 140-2 uh, Department of Defense Directives. So um, uh, people that need to meet uh, FIPS 140 can do so by configuring RHEL to provide only the appropriate ciphers. So um, RHEL experts know that you can set up RHEL in FIPS mode and then it provides only uh, DOD certified encryption and Ceph only, uh, Ceph doesn't come with its own encryption. It takes it from the operating system. So um, while Ceph is not FIPS 140 certified, the RHEL is, and, uh, and uh, Ceph will basically use uh, the certified cryptography from RHEL. Okay, that's, uh, that's all for encryption at rest. Now there is encryption in transit, which is another funny one. Now, the easy way is that network communication can be secured by turning on Ceph protocol encryption in the Messenger v2.1 protocol. The Messenger protocol is how Ceph nodes talk to each other, but also how Ceph clients talk to the Ceph platform. With um, the protocol, with 2.1 protocol, which has been out a few years now, um, I think it was introduced with Nautilus, which was what became Red Hat Ceph Storage 4. Um, It's possible to basically encrypt all traffic between clients and the Ceph net in the Ceph system, between the nodes of the Ceph system. Basically, anybody who says anything has to do it in uh, in ciphertext. Now, the interesting part is that um, data in transit is not often fully encrypted in Ceph. Um, typically. What is encrypted is what transits the networks that we were talking at the beginning about that are um, open, the ones where the clients work, or vulnerable in the definition of your threat model. Um, but most users do not willy-nilly encrypt all uh, uh, traffic because um, as I was saying earlier, and some parts of the traffic uh, that exists only between Ceph nodes is usually physically secured by dedicated networks, whether it's VLAN or uh, in many cases, uh, dedicated network interfaces. Because um, to have a distributed storage system like Ceph, you have to size the network so that if one node goes offline, recovery traffic between the surviving nodes is going to be such that it doesn't affect the performance of the cluster. Uh, it doesn't uh, overburden the nodes and it doesn't um, cause a packet storm that's so visible that it affects your ability to um, to serve customers. So uh, the network is a very big part of defining SF architecture. And when we design an, a cluster for a customer, we look at what happens when a node goes offline. I had a request a couple of days ago of someone that wanted a, a cluster with nodes of one petabyte each. And I, uh, I said, well, um, that may be overdoing it because if one of your nodes goes offline, the remaining nodes need to replicate one petabyte. It probably would be relatively easy to do if it was a 10 petabyte cluster because the uh, replication itself is many to many. So thanks to the factorial function, it's once you're over seven or eight, pretty much anything goes. Um, the many to many uh, communication takes care of almost anything. Um, but in this case, it was a four um, a four node cluster with um, with each node being one petabyte. So the surviving cluster would have only had three links, 
um, and uh, yeah, um, replicating one petabyte, well, replicating the surviving 750 terabytes over three links did not look too good. So um, for, this re for these reasons, and, be and there are typically dedicated network links in SS cluster, and these dedicated network links are private. So uh, cluster, uh, customers that are on the relatively lightweight side of the paranoid scale decide not to encrypt those. Um, these physically isolated networks are, uh, are separated from access, so they don't need that level of security. Compatibility and overheads are the primary reason why backend protocols are not encrypted. But in most use cases, the performance, in, performance impact is negligible for a properly designed cluster. If you have the right number of nodes for your storage, um, if you have designed the cluster correctly, you can turn on encryption and it will be shadowed by other things like network latency. The reality is that when your storage is distributed over multiple nodes, it's never going to have the latency of local storage. That's a simple reality. Uh, one of the best ways to upset someone who works in distributed storage is to do a benchmark comparing them with, um, with local storage and say your product is slower or your project is slower. It's like, yeah, but that's totally unfair. Of course, you have to comp compare distributed storage with distributed storage. You cannot compare with network storage. Even on AWS, you don't compare EBS which is distributed storage and network storage with a local, um, a local ephemeral drive. You can't. So because there is inherent latency in network communication, uh, in the network communication of distributed or, um, uh, or network storage, if you do things correctly, that network latency can shadow your, uh, your encryption overheads and it can be done transparently. And so I expect that encryption will pick up really, really fast here. Uh, primarily, not because it's a good idea, but primarily because uh, we have too much bureaucracy in the world, and it's becoming increasingly harder for people to argue with their um, with their security office. Well, this doesn't need to be encrypted. They would rather buy a bit more RAM and a few more CPUs, and just not having to explain that to to the security office, even though that's what they're already doing in their EMC or or NetApp appliances. As I said, you open the door, you tap inside the fabric, you're doing the same type of attack. But in the way the security office thinks of those, those are single machines. And so they're not, they're not worried about that. In a SF cluster, it's a rack of different machines. So it gets, it gets looked at as a different way, in a different way. That's fine. Uh, I'm all for more encryption. It's just a little bit of security theater, unfortunately. But um, if it gets more encryption, why not? Um, in general, you should maintain a proper uh, network hygiene and have firewalls at the individual nodes that only the ports that you plan to expose are exposed. Um, looking at more specific protocols, S3 service is usually secured between RGW and the S3 client. And these are the in transit networking um, things that are done by every customer. So. The exact opposite of what I was saying, backplane communication is not encrypted by most of them. The ones that I'm talking about now are encrypted by all of them. So um, if you're providing the S3 service, usually between RGW's, uh, RGW and the S3 client talking to RGW, uh, there is TLS on port 443, as you would imagine. Uh, plain port 80 unencrypted is an option for things that don't need to be encrypted. Like if you're serving web pages um, and you want to serve them in the clear, that's okay. Uh, but um, um, but any data that you serve uh, that is not public needs to be served over TLS. And that's what um, I would say all uh, S3 customers using RGW do. Uh, TLS termination. At HA proxy is a special case. So sometimes customers put HA proxy in front of RGW. And so uh, in that specific case, TLS termination goes from the uh, client to HA proxy. And then HA proxy needs to be in the appropriate security zone because it is going to talk in clear text to RGW. Um, 
So we're going to put RGW out in a safer zone. It doesn't need to be on the public facing front because HA proxy is the one that's exposed. And so HA proxy can, can talk in the clear to RGW because um, the interface of HA proxy to the inside and RGW's S3 interface in that case are in, in a protected network. Uh, okay, so standard practices like um, firewalling individual nodes obviously apply. The, these were the song of my hardware um, advisor. Um, uh, he be, Harvard has a network of about 100,000 machines or had a network of about 100,000 machines when I was studying there, which has been a while. Um, at the time, Harvard did not have a perimeter network around all of Harvard because my advisor thought that it was um, uh, pretend security. Because when you have 100,000 machines, you're going to be attacked from inside the perimeter <laughs> by another one of those 100,000 machines, not from the outside. And so his policy was that every node individually had to have its own firewall, not Harvard as a whole firewall for 100,000 machines that that wouldn't accomplish anything. And so I'm singing his, um, his song here, and I think he, he was right even for the small scale. So that's what I'm advocating. Now, <clears throat> let's look at Rook. So I need to give you a little bit more Rook terminology that probably and uh, not even Neha gave you. So um, CRDs are um, resource definitions uh, in the Rook format, which are basically YAML files. Um, you can think of them as configuration files for Rook. Now, security preferences can be encoded in CRDs, um, like um, trust certificates for the RGW web server, so that when you bring up Ceph, Rook can also configure uh, the certificate that you want. Um, RGW to expose, and you don't have to worry about that. Uh, Rook will manage that for you henceforth. Uh, as long as you remember to, to renew the certificate when it's expiring, everything else will be taken care of. When spinning, new, uh, spinning up new RGWs, Rook will take care of putting that in place, and so on. Uh, Rook also supports at rest data encryption, as we, as we discussed earlier. Um, and uh, the in-flight Ceph protocol encryption is not supported in Rook yet, but it's being worked on and it's coming next. It's just a setting from Rook's point of view. It's just um, not there yet. Um, you should frankly be in any event using the cloud's uh, extremely flexible software defined networking uh, to segregate unencrypted traffic to, to private networks. I mean, um, many of these clusters are running either on on Amazon or um, or on a VMware platform or on some other form of software defined data center. So there is really no, no excuse for you not being able to put unencrypted traffic on its own dedicated network. I was saying that most people do it on physical networks already, but what we're discussing with Rook is almost always a software defined data center. Actually, it's always a software defined data center. So uh, you can literally create as many dedicated networks as you want and segregate unencrypted traffic. So um, that, should be, that should be something that you are doing anyway, regardless. Um, standard Kubernetes permission apply to persistent volumes. So nothing really special here. You can uh, set permissions to your heart's content. Uh, more interesting, perhaps, is um, um, key management uh, support in the CSI driver. Uh, so um, I was discussing this with uh, Vault before, where Vault would go in and uh, swap keys. Um, um, you can use a KMS system to do the same thing. Uh, and in the case of the CSI driver, um, this is supported for individual PVs. So PVs are persistent volumes. They are the unit of storage that gets provided to containers. So you can have potentially every unit of storage that's provided to individual containers encrypted with their own key. I don't think I've seen anybody do this yet, but, uh, but it's a pretty cool possibility. Um, 
if you can make it transparent. I mean, if, you know, if the KMS is providing the keys, so there is nothing that gets in the way um, of operations, that is, that is really cool. And at least as a security nerd, maybe it doesn't excite you, but I find it cool. Um, so uh, what about controlling the cluster itself? So the control plane for Ceph is, uh, is SSH, right? Um, uh, Ceph ADM, which is the built-in control plane uh, that was introduced with the recent versions of Ceph and with Red Hat Ceph Storage 5. Ceph Ansible, the legacy um, configuration system that we used in uh, Ceph versions through to four at Red Hat. And other tools like um, SUSE used to use Salt um, uh, as a, their management tool of choice and so on. They use SSH as a way to deliver commands to individual nodes. So um, all, the, all day one tools or most day one tools in, um, in the Ceph world use SSH to provide a secure command path for installed and upgrade operations. Uh, this is common these days. Um, this, the control channel popularized. I'm going to give credit to Ansible for doing this uh, for host management. I think that Puppet and Chef popularized um, DevOps style management and got a lot of administrators over the hurdle of wait, if somebody gets the keys, they can attack my entire network. Uh, yes, that's what the systems management is. So I think that they. They got to accept that with that. Um, but I think that um, Ansible really got the, the SSH bit uh, to, be, to be so accepted. And we're very much in the, in the SSH train. Uh, you cannot run a SAS cluster without SSH connections between the nodes. Uh, the management dashboard, which is the UI, monitoring and management is there, um, is usually not exposed to the world. But if it needs to be reachable by the operator, uh, but it needs to be reachable by the operator's workstation to be of, of use. So it's usually going to be accessible to the corporate um, um, network, not to um, uh, not to everybody. Um, it is uh, supporting port four four three, so you can encrypt it, but. We wouldn't advocate for opening that to the world. Um, and that's something that really the, the local operator needs to choose where is the right place to put the dashboard and what, what level of access do you want to give? Obviously, in, access to the dashboard is, is protected, but, um, but still, it's a very obvious attack point. So uh, you, want to, you want to choose what uh, of the various access zones that should be living in. Uh, based on your track model. Lastly, uh, the manager, which is another daemon uh, that provides uh, functionality. It's another cluster daemon that provides functionality to the dashboard. So think of the dashboard as the UI. The manager daemon is the backend that does the, the infrastructure control of Ceph, the MGR. Um, um, because it supports the entire infrastructure, it also needs to be accessible uh, on the storage access zone so that, so that it can do its job. Let's uh, have a quick overview of how identity and access works here. So Ceph's use, Ceph's use of keys protects clusters from man in the middle attacks by default. And the, the authentication system to access the Ceph cluster is uh, these shared keys that are called CephX. Uh, that are in use for authentication. Uh, these are not always and um, not often visible to the outside of the Ceph cluster, because as I was saying, uh, the main consumers are S3, OpenStack, and Kubernetes. So the, the drivers have to have access um, to the Ceph cluster, but the consumers are using the S3 protocol to access and different authentication there, or um, um, the library uh, or kernel drivers that access the file system or the block storage have authentication at their level. Um, by default, uh, CephX protects from uh, MTM attacks. Now, um, a good practice here is to grant key ring read and write permissions only for the current user and the root. 
uh, with client admin user restricted to root only. RGW predictably, uh, RGW the object gateway, predictably supports the key and secret model used by AWS. It um, needs to mimic S3, so that's it's pretty obvious. And it supports the equivalent model for uh, OpenStack Swift. Um, the administrator's key and secrets should be treated with the appropriate respect. Use administrative users sparingly to reduce risk profile. Uh, there really shouldn't be a need to use an administrative user with S3 most of the time. Um, people who do it usually do it out of laziness, so really not recommended. Um, RGW's user data is stored in Ceph pools, um, which should be secured as we discussed previously. So data at rest encrypted, nothing strange there. So the data at rest uh, encryption is done at the level of the Ceph cluster. Once it's done once there, it secures all protocols. And so it, um, it will secure RGW uh, data, but also RGW user data as well, because it's stored in the Ceph cluster itself. So no additional thing is needed here if you've done the data at rest encryption to begin with. Um, LDAP, Active Directory, and Keystone, the OpenStack authentication, are used, uh, uh, are supported as identity vaults, so the users can be coming from there. And that's where usually user authentication comes from. Typically, you don't issue CephX keys to the end user. You either give them an LDAP account or an LDAP dash Active Directory account or a Keystone account. That's usually what they get. Um, okay, that's it for users. Now, operator actions against the cluster are, are logged and uh, should be periodically reviewed. Um, they're also aggregated to your log management system. So if you have something like Splunk, you probably want to aggregate these so that you can, uh, you can mine them for, for unusual activity. Nothing, um, nothing unusual here, it's best practices in general. Now, how do you delete data when you want to get rid of it? Now, once data is deleted from a Ceph cluster, it generally cannot be recovered from pra for practical use. Um, but uh, there are some excep exceptions. So RBD, the block storage driver, um, supports something called trash bin. So let's say that you have a virtual machine image and you deleted it. In, if you're running a Ceph cluster in the default configuration, this would be in the trash bin where the space is ready to be reclaimed if you need it. Um, but otherwise the image is still there in case you change your mind. Um, so the dynamics there are either you schedule deletion after a certain number of days, or it can happen because of um, a spare pool capacity is needed. The object store, just like Amazon S3 versions everything. So by going into RGW and saying, give me the older version of this thing that I just deleted, you can also retrieve an object that you thought was gone. Uh, so if uh, uh, data retention is a concern, you have to configure that pool appropriately to, um, to manage around versioning. You may basically don't want versioning if you want to um, uh, be able to destroy things permanently in that fashion. And then there is the interesting bit, which is what do you do uh, when, uh, uh, when you have to have secure deletion because you're retiring a drive or a cluster? Now, um, stuff is all copy on write, so you can't go and say overwrite this object. You are not overwriting that object. <laughs> if you're doing it in RGW, you're just creating a new version of that object. If you're doing it in block storage, um, you're writing some other part of the cluster, the old data is probably still there. So if you're trying to delete uh, something not for practical use, but for secure deletion, um, the best practice here is that you do at rest encryption, which should be doing anyway 
for the reasons that we discussed a couple of times before. And then um, when you decide to retire the media, you replace the, the encryption key and you throw away the key. Um, that is going to be fast and it's going to be as secure as can be. Um, the other thing that you can do is that you can physically degauss the drive, which are uh, which is something that is convenient in other ways. Um, uh, degaussing a drive doesn't destroy it physically, so it doesn't doesn't preclude your ability to return it to the vendor if it's an RMA for a failed drive that you have. Um, and it's it's super fast. You basically just put it in the machine and it comes out a second later, right? So um, if you have a degausser, by all means. But um, if you're going to handle this in software, the way to do it is to use a, use a, a new encryption key and throw away throw away your private key so you cannot read this anymore. Uh, looking at the infrastructure, uh, hardening options are highly vendor dependent. Um, so the following are uh, sort of our choices with Red Hat. Uh, other self distributions will be different. Now we ship with SE Linux on by default in enforcing mode. And that shouldn't be a surprise for anybody given that SE Linux is sort of a religion over here. Um, we can make um, use of FIPS 142 uh, ciphers as I detailed before. Um, these always trail the most recent version of RHEL and the most recent version of Ceph because it takes a while for us to submit uh, the code to uh, the Defense uh, Information Security Agency and getting the certification back. In election years where BISA is busy securing federal election infrastructure, this gets particularly long. Uh, but um, in uh, non-election years, this is just a few months. So. Um, uh, we've been catching up since the election, and uh, right now we're at 8.2. We have submissions for 8.3 and 8.4 and 4 in, and uh, I think that they're going to be um, coming back pretty quickly because they've been there already for a while. So um, they're sort of due. Um, hardening of binaries is also of interest. Uh, I believe uh, Red Hat Ceph storage binaries use these, uh, but I need to double check. Um, these are basically options of what uh, is allowed uh, in terms of binaries. Uh, these are kernel options of what is going to be allowed in terms of um, uh, what you can do with system calls, uh, what you can do in terms of um, uh, messing around with the stack and um, and so on. So. Um, I would recommend all of these and a few more, um, but uh, these are a good start. Uh, Pi is position independent executables. Um, SecComp is, um, I believe SecComp is the one that restricts uh, the, um, the system calls you can make. Um, ASLR and the other uh, two versions of uh, those restrictions are similar. They just operate on different parts of the of the binary. So uh, there is actually another presentation that I gave at um, at BNU many years ago, which is uh, the um, security hardening of the of the Ubuntu kernel. I go over all of these options individually. If you're curious, um, it's a really long presentation, but uh, and um, it's interesting if you want to see what um, what all of these um, um, binary hardening options can do. And I don't think that all of the ASLR strategies were available then. So um, there are a couple that are probably not in this presentation, but most of them are there. Okay, so um, hope it wasn't too dense. Um, that's um, that's what we have. <laughs> Thank you, Federico. Yeah, thanks, Federico. Thank you, sir. So, a couple of resources. Um, uh, managing and securing Kubernetes secrets. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Um, when I was talking about Rook, I somehow skipped over this. 
Um, Kubernetes secrets are just um, hashed. They are not encrypted. And they are uh, hashed with a one-way hash. Uh, I'm sorry, with a, with a hash that's easily reversible, not, not a one-way hash. So um, uh, I, don't, I didn't see Bill Ricker, but he would have lots of jokes about um, that as a strategy for keeping secrets. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm being good. Okay. So um, those, that's not security. That's just obfuscation. If somebody is looking over your shoulder, they cannot really copy down the gibberish fast enough. But um, if somebody can copy down the string, they can reverse that trivially. So um, there are strategies for managing and securing Kubernetes secrets, and you should use all of them. Uh, Rani Osnat at Acquia has written a very nice tutorial about that. Um, the problem with, with Kubernetes secrets is that because Kubernetes is configured with CRDs, these only present resource files in YAML, if you, you put a secret in one of these files, it's going to be in, it's going to be hashed in the thing, and um, um, it's a container, and the the container itself should not be a secret. So uh, you can't put the burden of security on the container. You should you should put your secrets elsewhere. Uh, but yeah, this this is a good tutorial on how to do it. Um, Federico, yeah, are these supposed to be links to resources? Because we're not seeing uh, URLs. Uh, yeah, the the when I give you the slides, uh, you can actually click on these, and um, the the blue on the slide means you can click and and it takes you somewhere. Actually, could you copy and paste them into the chat window? Uh, copy and paste what? Uh, the links? The links, yeah. OK, let me see if I can manage that. Oopsie. So, oop, 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 oop. Oh, there we go. Um, Link. Let's see. Copy link. Copy link. And copy link. Uh, while I do this, let me uh, talk. So, um, second one is Michael Hausenblatt and Andrew Martin's Hacking Kubernetes book, which came out quite recently. Um, it has a very nice chapter on storage. And um, it takes a slightly different tack than I did. So there is something interesting there as well. Um, uh, I've been reading and taking notes myself. I really like their treatment. So that is another interesting thing. Uh, let me see. Uh, paste. This one is the Acquia. And um, the O'Reilly book obviously is not public, but this is where it lives. Uh, data security and hardening guide. This is one of the 22 or so manuals that come with Red Hat Test Storage. So this one is not public, but um, it, is, uh, it is part of the documentation uh, for Red Hat Test Storage. And a similar documentation is present in the, in the um, Ceph uh, project upstream. And then um, I was talking about uh, the Acquia security tutorial about encrypting secrets. The, um, the Kubernetes documentation also has documentation on how to encrypt data at rest. Um, of course, nobody reads the documentation, but um, if they were, if they were reading the documentation, then they would know how to uh, keep their containers secure. And that is a, a good bit of, um, of docs, if you ask me. So it's worth um, worth the shout, shout out. And uh, quite a few people have pitched in here. And uh, the list is ever expanding. So um, thanks to everybody that that uh, contributed. 
And uh, yeah, basically we are at the, are there any questions points? I'm not hearing anything. All righty. So I'm sorry I disappointed Bill with uh, with revealing the secret of Kubernetes secrets not being secrets, but but that's <laughs> that's the number one uh, that's the number one weak spot if you ask me of of all of this. Yeah, okay, well. so many so many people don't don't even pay attention to it. <laughs> okay. Bill was just being nice. As, as long as it's like not on the uh, command line, so that it shows up in proc. <laughs> no, it's it's. I don't think it goes that far. It doesn't go that far, but it's rock thirteen security in in a sense. If you can get to the configuration file, which you can, if you can get to the container, then you can get to the quote secret. Yeah. And, and that, if, if, if we can get inside the container, we're probably going to get everything. That's just life. Right. right. right and and that, unless, unless you want an operator to log in to unlock every secret file with a Key that's on a yellow sticky right. on the monitor, right? <laughs> um, and then you're down until their page to look at the yellow sticky. Exactly. And then there is the other mitigating thing, which is that hopefully this is only compromising that container. It's not compromising the entire infrastructure. But it really depends on what the secret is, right? Because the Kubernetes secret mechanism is is a general purpose mechanism, so you could use it for anything. And you really need to be aware of the fact that it, it's not secure in any way. So um, that really needs to be lesson number one, uh, so that people think about what they put in there and what they don't put in there. Beyond that, it's, it, I mean, it's fine. It's the same as when you need to put a, a password in a, in a bash file. If you, if you have to, you have to think about what you're doing. Who is that noise? Uh, it's Muslim Jerry. If there are no other, uh, no other questions, I guess we might as well call it a night. Sounds good. Okay. Very good. I will right. stop the live stream. Frederick, you're going to send me the slides, right? I, I will send you the slides. Um, I'll make you a new version with uh, with 